outer world is insanely polarized. Vertical is both an expression of and is at the root of this extreme polarization and dissociation in both the human psyche and the world at large. If humanity is seen as a single macro-organism, it is as if there is a fissure, a primordial dissociation, a split deep within its very source, just as an individual can suffer from a dissociation within their psyche, so can a nation and a people. Our species is suffering from what Jung calls a sickness of dissociation, a state of fragmentation and incoherence deep within the collective unconscious, which Jung equates with God. This dissociation has seemingly spilled outside of our skulls and has taken the form of certain collective events playing out on the world stage. We are at a severe crisis point in our world, which, medically speaking, tells us that our sickness is reaching a dangerous climax. Neurosis Jung calls humanity's split consciousness, in which the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. The mental disorder of our day, playing out on the world stage. This dissociation has its source in the collective psyche of modern humanity, suffering from a disunity with ourselves. We then identify with a partial aspect of ourselves and project our shadow onto the outside world. It is the face of our own unrealized shadow that glowers at us in the face of the enemy. The world then acts out our shadow giving us all the evidence we need that the evil is to be found outside of us. Split in two, we become neurotic as hell. We are living in the time of the splitting of the world. Our fragmented outer world is dissociated like the inner psyche of a neurotic. Lying behind our neurosis is concealed all of the genuine suffering that we have, for whatever reason, been unwilling to bear and unable to embrace. Theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer observes, Suffering willingly endured is stronger than evil. It spells death to evil. We foreclose on the chance of real happiness if we refuse the genuine suffering that is sent our way as part of life. Jung famously writes, Neurosis is always the substitute for legitimate suffering. When we suppress the legitimate suffering, that is ours to bear, we create a substitute form of neurotic suffering that can be more painful than the legitimate suffering. Neurosis is not a localized illness that only affects a small isolated part of us, but something that affects the whole human being on all levels. Because Neurosis is only a symptom of a deeper imbalance. The focus of therapy should not be on what Jung calls 
the fiction of neurosis, but rather on the whole human being who is suffering from the neurosis. Neurosis splits us from our psychic wholeness. The outbreak of neurosis is not a matter of chance. It is usually the moment when a new psychological adaptation is demanded by life. According to Jung, neurosis is the suffering of a soul that has not discovered its meaning. The absence of meaning, the senselessness and aimlessness of life can be thought of as the fundamental neurosis of our age. Neurosis oftentimes emerges when people content themselves with inadequate or wrong answers to the questions of life. As Jung realized, many neuroses are caused by people blinding themselves to their natural spiritual promptings. Neurosis is an attempt to escape from our inner voice and hence flee from our vocation and ultimately from ourself. What Jung calls our neurotic perversion conceals our vocation, our destiny, and the full realization of our inherent will to life. To actualize itself, the neurotic is someone who has fallen victim to their own illusions. Like a psychic barometer, neurosis can tell us when and where we are spraying from our individual paths and destiny. People who have fallen neurotic are often potentially destined to be the bearers of new creative cultural ideals. We stay stuck in neurosis only as long as we remain obedient children who bow down before authority and refuse the freedom that is our destiny. Giving our power away to an external authority, which is to betray the powerful impulse of our nature to develop, express and realize itself, simply strengthens the very forces that made us sick in the first place. As psychologist Otto Rank points out, the neurotic is a potential artist who, failing to access the creativity hidden within the powerful transpersonal energies from which they suffer, is unable to transform their inner conflicts into art. In their compulsive and self-destructive acting out, the person in a neurotic state can be compared to someone who is bewitched. Our personal neuroses are reflections of the great problems of society and our times. Due to our interconnectedness with the whole of reality, our particular neurosis is an individual attempt however unsuccessful, to resolve a universal problem. We are individual nodes of awareness in a vast interactive self-synchronizing and reciprocally co arising living network. We are all parts of the great stream of human history which countless times has experienced conflicts and neurotic patterns that we each mistakenly use as evidence for our personal craziness. Recognizing the greater archetypal pattern that we are expressions of can 
take our neurosis out of the realm of pathology, dispel our feelings of isolation and help us feel connected to all of humanity and more at one with ourselves. The implications are clear. If we avoid the shadow, we ensure we will remain neurotic. And if we don't deal with our neurosis, we will be avoiding and thus feeding the shadow. We are mostly asleep to the iron curtain that splits the soul of humanity. And we need some form of wake-up call to rectify our inner dissociation. All of the evil that is playing out in the world is a loud alarm clock letting us know that it's time to wake up and recognize our own hand, our complicity in creating the dark shadow of evil that has enveloped our world. Neurosis is by no means solely negative. It has a positive aspect that holds the key to accessing the wholeness of our psyche, the hidden part of our self. We need to learn not simply how to get rid of our neurosis, but how to carry and bear it, to go into it so that it can reveal its deeper meaning. Our neurosis is teaching us something about ourself that we clearly haven't been able to learn any other way. So trying to get rid of it without uncovering its deeper meaning is analogous to attacking a fever in the belief that it is the noxious agent rather than recognizing that the fever is an expression of the process of healing that is on the way. Neurosis is nature's attempt to heal us. We so easily think of neurosis of being worthless, but contained within it, in hidden form, is the alchemical gold that we cannot find anywhere else. Neurosis is an attempt by the self-regulating nature of the psyche to restore balance to the overall psychic system, similar to how our night dreams compensate a one-sidedness in the dreamer. A neurosis is only truly healed when it transforms a false attitude. We don't cure our neurosis, it cures us. Our neurosis is ultimately of numinous origin, the core of the neurosis of our time. Jung's colleague Erich Neumann writes is The search for the self. In this sense, neurosis are a kind of sacred disease. Though our neurosis strengthens and seems to feed into and off of our feelings of alienation, its origin is actually to be found in the wholeness creating tendency of the self. Paradoxically, neurosis splits us off from our psychic wholeness, while simultaneously being an expression of that very wholeness attempting to actualize itself through us. Where the process of neurosis feeds into evil is the loss of our relationship with our psychic totality. The cure for neurosis, as well as the alleviation of evil, involves reconnecting with our wholeness. For sure, no, I'm happy to do that. 
So the idea of Watiko is a Native American term that really connotes this cannibalistic spirit and it can be conceived as, of as being this mind virus. And, um, and when people hear, uh, you know, the idea of a mind virus, it can sound really kind of woo woo or new agey. But what it ultimately means, as I point out again and again, is that the source and the solution of the collective madness and evil that we're playing out in the world is to be found within the psyche. And that's a no brainer, you know? And just one thing about like, you know, um, Gurdjieff was talking about that humanity has fallen asleep. And of course, he was trying to figure out how do I wake them up? But what he, he realized, they weren't just asleep. He also realized it was as if there was this malevolent force inside of us that was invested in keeping us asleep. And that's what, so with Tico being a mind virus, you know, it operates through the blind spots of the unconscious, through the projective tendencies of the mind in such a way that we entrance ourselves. We actually bewitch ourselves as if we've put ourselves under a spell. There's no one else who's done that, no external force. We are actually colluding with our own victimization. And how I first discovered this was in my own life. And, you know, I, I wrote a, like this major book about it. I, I won't go into the story, but it had to do, I'm an only child, and it had to do that my father was possessed by this very force, unbeknowings to me and him and really anyone. And I was the recipient of him acting out his unhealed abuse. And it created enormous suffering for me from the to the point where I went from being a you know very accomplished, happy, healthy kid to when I was in college. I and afterwards the abuse, you know, that I suffered, the emotional abuse, it stopped me from living my life. And I went so deeply inwards into what is actually going on that um, in 1981 I had a full blown spiritual awakening. I got hit by a bolt of lightning just in my brain. It ignited, not from outside. And I began to have the realization, oh, my God, we're having a collectively shared dream. And I was so excited at what I was realizing, you know, because what I another way of describing what I was realizing is that I was seeing through the imagination of the separate self. And I was realizing, wow, we're dream characters in each other's dream. We're dreaming up this universe each and every moment into materialization. We're interconnected, interdependent, not separate. And my heart was bursting with love and compassion. And of course, right away, I got thrown in a mental hospital and told, oh, you, you're having a psychotic <laughs> break. And I knew, I knew I wasn't. I mean, it was made very, very crystal clear to me that I was awakening. And that's what saved me. Because in that next almost two years, I was hospitalized because I was a free agent. I wasn't in an ashram or a monastery. I was just out in the world and I was freaking people out with you know, what I was trying to express creatively. And so I always got pathologized. So oh, you, you have this new chemical imbalance, you're bipolar. And, and I not for one second bought into it, you know, and that, like I said, that's what saved me. But then I began to realize the same darker force that had come through the person of my father that had possessed him was now coming through the system of psychiatry and then I began to recognize, like an iteration of a fractal, that that same non-local evil force was also informing and giving shape to the greater body politic of humanity. And I began to realize, oh my God, there's like this malevolent force that's holographically encoded within the non-local field, within our minds, that actually is giving shape to what's playing out in the world. And the origin of that force is within us. And so that's when I began. So it was like I began to, I was tracking and making maps and beginning to illumine and articulate like a higher dimensional process that every spiritual tradition or visionary artists or philosophers or thinkers, they're all, they've all been pointing at exactly this. I mean, the apocryphal text calls it the counterfeiting spirit, you know, yeah. and it's the source of the greatest evil. And this counterfeiting spirit that is what Tico, it has no creativity at all, but it plugs into our unconscious creativity to the extent that we're not actually consciously expressing our creativity. It plugs into our creative spirit, which is our nature, and turns it against us in a way that creates a cocoon around us and suffocates us, in which we then collude in killing ourselves, which is exactly what we're doing. And But what I'm pointing out in my work is that encoded in this seeming evil force 
it's actually this revelation. It's actually helping us. Like you were saying, it's catalyzing our revolution. So it's like a quantum phenomena in a superposition of states that it, it contains both the deepest, darkest evil and the most sublime, highest blessing. And how this force manifests depends solely on if we recognize what it's revealing to us. Mm -hmm. And so this is my third book, the one that just came out on Watiko, because, you know, like Castaneda and the Castaneda books, you know, Carlos's teacher talks about Watiko. He doesn't have the name. He calls it the predator or other names. He says for shamans, this is the topic of topics. And that's completely right. There's nothing more important than understanding this, because if we don't understand this, then everything else is a moot point because we're yeah. destroying ourselves. We're enacting collective suicide. And I'm just like, my whole work is shedding light on the nature of this mind virus and how, how it operates. You see, it's an inner disease of the soul that actually has a magical ability to synchronistically, to like somehow extend itself into the world and synchronistically configure events in the outer world so as to reveal and express itself. And what yeah. I just described where the outer reflects the inner, that's a dream. And, you know, to actually to connect with the dreamlike nature and, uh, you know, and what is the language of dreams? It's symbols to really cultivate symbolic awareness. This is the way as we establish ourselves in that realization that we're actually having a collectively shared dream. Um, that point of view is the very perspective that dissolves what you go. Yeah, well, this whole kind of notion of uh, like a, a type of awakening. Um, I, over, over the years, and especially over the last three years, it's almost like there's an outer awakening and then there's an inner awakening. So you can kind of wake up to the external conspiracies and 9-11 and uh, pandemics and um, all of the JFK and all of that. These are all kind of external um, manifestations of a conspiracy. What I was always more interested in, and this is one of the reasons why I got into uh, Gurdjieff, was that he was more concerned about the inner conspiracy. And um, he he had a term which is always kind of a mystery to all of the students and probably all of the readers of Kerchev, and it's a thing called the organ kundabatha, um, which he said was implanted into humanity to make the world topsy turvy or inverted or um, to, to not to see reality as it truly is. Um, so what what I was going to ask you is, with regards to Watiko, um, so what we're saying is Watiko is something that is within. It's like a inner virus, um, and then it's projected out into the world. So we're basically creating this kind of uh, topsy turvy clown world. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, the thing about Watiko, one of the ways it works, one of its strategies is to distract us, where we put our attention outside, thinking mm -hmm. the problem or the solution is outside. And what I'm pointing out in my work is we intrinsically have this creative genius that's our nature we you know i wrote a book on quantum physics where i point out that quantum physics you know and and it's actually offering the medicine for watiko that is actually showing us the incredible creative agency that we are creating our experience each and every moment no one else is doing that we are doing that by the way we interpret the waking ink blot and place meaning on our experience and the the point is is that we each of us inherently have this unbelievable creative power um but to the extent that we're not aware of it one can conceive of this this mind virus as plugging in to that creative agency and turning it against us all humans are spirits only visiting this world all spirits are forever beings all encounters with other people or experiences and all experiences are forever connections. Real people close the circle of each experience. We do not leave ends frayed as mutants do. If you walk away with bad feelings in your heart for another person, and that circle is not closed, it will be repeated later in your life. You will not suffer once, but over and over, until you learn. It is good to observe, to learn, and become wiser from what has happened.
It is good to give thanks, as you say, to bless it, and walk away in peace. Healing has only one source. Doctors can aid the body by removing foreign particles, injecting chemicals, setting and realigning bones. But that does not mean the body will heal. In fact, I'm certain there has never been a doctor anywhere, at any time, in any country, at any period in history, who ever healed anything. Each person's healer is within. Doctors are at best those who have recognized an individual talent, developed it, and are privileged enough to be able to serve the community by doing what they do best and love doing. Being a form of psychic blindness, vertical, as I can't mention often enough, only has power over us to the extent it is not seen. Vertical will therefore use everything in its bag of tricks to evade our scrutiny. Vertical is plucked into and not separate from our process of perception. Vertical is not something objective out there, but rather is inseparable from the act of perceiving. It is as if Vetico has a radar charming device wherever anyone begins tracking it too closely. The mind virus will use its connection to the non-local field to hide from being seen. In a real-world example, the ever-increasing censorship happening in our media today has the fingerprints of Vetico all over it. Whenever anyone tries to shed light onto the dark Vetico inspired goings on in our world, if it contradicts the official mainstream narrative, a narrative informed by Vetico, they become victims of attack pieces and are censored and they're platformed. Crazy as it is, people who unthinkingly subscribe to consensus reality are convinced that they are in possession of the truth and they are reinforced in this conviction because the overwhelming majority of people in their echo chambers having also bought into what the powers that be want them to think have a similar take on things. Supporting one another in their deluded state, they insanely believe they are awake and yet they have become brainwashed. Their perceptions managed and their minds massaged into shape so as to become mouthpieces for what the corporatocracy that controls the mainstream media wants them to believe. People under the spell of Vetico find it practically impossible to imagine the extent and extremity of the lie they have fallen under and have naively assumed to be true. Parroting what they have been told is true. Towing the party line, they believe they are thinking for themselves, not realizing that their thinking is being done for them. Having drunk the Kool-Aid, their minds are programmed such that they have become unwitting instruments being used to propagate the spell they are under to the world at large. 
if we see things differently from consensus reality. We open up to being accused of either being a tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy terrorist, an idiot, evil, a domestic terrorist under a spell, or any number of unsavory things, basically seen as a threat. We will then be concretized, otherized, demonized and marginalized, which basically is to be energetically excommunicated from society in one form or another. We are in turn blocked from reaping the apparent benefits available to those who unquestioningly go along with the collectively sanctioned program. It has become dangerous to espouse a difficult viewpoint than what the powers that be want us to believe. This isn't some paranoid conspiracy theory, but a sober assessment of a very concerning situation that is undeniably happening out in the open for all who have eyes to see. Feeling like we have to be a certain way, that one has to form fit and shrink wrap oneself into a culturally sanctioned version of who we're supposed to be, opens us up to Wittico's nefarious influence. If we get hooked into believing, for whatever reason, that we have to offer a prefabricated version of who we are, practically tying oneself up in a pretzel so as to feel like we're meeting others' expectations, we are on our way to becoming disoriented as to who we actually are and our true path in life. We are thereby a dream come true for Wetico. Easy prey to be used for its sinister purposes. Over the years of studying Wetico, I've realized that one of the main ways it works is by shutting down our voice, both inner and outer. The essence of all of the multiple variations of the theme of abuse comes down to the message that it's not safe to authentically and fully express oneself. Hence, we have to hide, compartmentalize or shut down parts of ourselves, a process that is both inspired by and feeds vertical. Once this dynamic becomes internalized within our mind and rendered unconscious, it becomes our subconscious operating system and is hence invisible to us. We then become our own control system and preemptively, without even realizing it, we shut down without the aid of any external force. We then invariably feel constrained and victimized by the world, without realizing our complicity in killing our own voice, so as to stay safe in a world that is perceived as dangerous. This is why the healing of Wetico involves courageously connecting with our authentic voice and expressing oneself creatively. 
In the cancel culture that we now live in, there is a sense that it is dangerous to offend anyone, that it's simply not safe to reveal who we are or what we think or believe. Many of us have learned there are certain taboo areas or no-fly zones, even with our closest friends and family members. Topics that are off limits, that are not okay to bring up for fear of triggering someone. Becoming hypervigilant, we fall into the chronic unconscious habit of monitoring our environment and ourselves, so as to know what's safe to reveal about ourselves. A most unnatural process that further opens the door for Vetico's preternatural influence. Being triggered. One of the most important things we can do to depotentiate Vetico in our world is to make sure that we don't contribute to it. There is a strong unconscious tendency in people when encountering Vetico to add more Vetico to the field via our unconscious reactions to seeing it. This is to say that one of the main ways Vetico replicates itself in the field is through our involuntary, automatic, unconscious reactions to it. Though Vetico can seem so esoteric, it is something each one of us is intimately familiar within our interactions with one another in our everyday lives. Not only does it play out in our own mind, it informs, gives shape to, and propagates through our relationships with others. One of the main ways Vetico insinuates itself into our relationships is when we get triggered by something that someone else is doing or saying. When I get triggered, my IQ drops 30 points. 30 points might be an understatement. What he said was so obviously true that it elicited no argument from me at all. When we get triggered by Vetico, our rationality, our intelligence, our ability to self-reflect often goes out the window. Just like seeing the unconscious in someone necessarily activates our own unconscious, seeing vertical in someone else practically guarantees money back that vertical will be triggered in us. Being triggered in itself isn't a manifestation of vertical. It's how we react to being triggered that is the key. If we have a knee-jerk reaction, indulging in and acting out our trigger, then in our unconscious reaction, which is almost always rooted in past unhealed trauma and wounding, we are unknowingly offering ourselves up to vertical. 
in a seemingly interminable process that is not just unproductive, but can be hurtful and traumatizing for all concerned, operating through individuals, vertical spreads, virus-like, through the unconscious masses, replicating itself and bonding people together through their shared wounding, trauma and unconsciousness. Vertigo thus exploits groups of people and, on a larger scale, masses of people to propagate its evil. In Buddhist literature, taking the bait and being hooked in Tibetan called Shenpa and then acting out our triggered reactions is likened to a highly contagious disease, a virus. Sound familiar? In that, it will then activate other people's triggers and wounds, which will then reignite our own. This is a circle process that at a certain point loops back on itself and becomes self-generating. Left unchecked, it will spin out of control. All the participants are then swept away in the undertow of the unconscious dark archetypal forces that are beyond our conscious understanding and drive the whole process, while Vatico rejoices as it inspires these self-generating cycles of chaos, conflict and wounding. But if when we are triggered we are able to become aware of and acknowledge that we've gotten triggered and choose to simply notice it and not act on it. We have created space around the triggering event and can thereby become more spacious. In this way, we can interrupt our unconscious habitual compulsive reactions which takes away the fuel of vertical. Then we, instead of vertical, can rejoice. If we are then able to self-reflectively turn our awareness to the underlying source of our trigger, invariably a wound of some sort, at that moment we will be able to assimilate and transmute that tiny unit of vertical that is keeping our wound alive in its unconscious state, a process that feeds the light of our own conscious awareness. This is to say that vertical, when arising, in the field between us, as actually due to the way we hold it, expanded our consciousness. This is a key characteristic of vertical. It is the source of incredible conflict between people and yet if recognized in the moment that it arises, it can deepen our intimacy and strengthen our connection with one another, as well as feed our lucid awareness, encoded in the very pathology of vertical, 
is its own medicine. Poetico is a field phenomenon. We can only start to see it when we recognize the underlying unified quantum field in which we are all contained, of which we are expressions. When someone in a family system becomes a conduit for vertical, be it an actual family, a group of people, an institution, a nation, or our entire species, it affects and is an expression of the state of the whole non-local field, which interfaces with and is not separate from our own mind. Do you understand the non-local agency of vertical? We can't just focus on one person in isolation from the rest of the family system, but rather we need to look at how all of the interrelated roles in the system reciprocally co-arise and mutually condition and reinforce one another. In the non-local quantum field, there are new separate parts interacting. Instead, all of the seemingly discrete aspects of the system are ultimately expressions of and inseparable from one another and from the greater whole. It is only when the whole system and underlying non-local field that informs and gives shape to it are brought into focus that we can begin to see, sometimes with the force of a revelation, how vertical behind the scenes, choreographs all of the myriad interlocking roles that compose the field to play out the way it does. A spectral devilish agent, Whitico has a backstage quality that surreptitiously moves among unwitting groups of people activating their unconscious wounds, traumas, and unhealed abuse issues, each in their own unique way, so as to incite misunderstandings between them. Elusive as hell, no one knows where to find the source of the confusion, so we typically find someone else to blame. Few suspect the culprit is to be found deep within our own mind and in our unconscious reactions. The abuse, trauma and wounding that happen in relationships could never play out the way they do, and the person in the role of the abuser could never get away with such abuse, without the field conspiring to enable it, crucial to understanding the phenomenon of vertical and the abuse that it inspires, is seeing how individuals are being dreamed up to pick up interdependent roles in the field that, when seen together as a whole, operate in a way that is analogous to iron filings organizing around an invisible magnetic field. This is how vertical creates the circumstance through which it is able to propagate itself throughout the quantum field. It is only when the deeper pattern that connects and informs all of the interconnected parts comes into focus that we are able to recognize that vertical is a field phenomenon, which is to begin 
to see it. When abuse, a manifestation of vertical and the concomitant wounding that is the inevitable result is enacted in a family system, the field invariably gets conjured up to hide the abuse and protect the abuser. This is an expression of how vertical non-locally configures the field so as to perpetuate itself. Typically, one person acts out the role of the abuser and other people collude with the abuse by turning a blind eye to it or by protecting the abuser by hiding or rationalizing their behavior. The unconscious collaboration between the abuser and the field that is conjured up around the abuser to protect them. What is literally a non-local protection racket further cements and preserves the wound that is the result of the abuse. There are countless examples where this plays out in families, intimate relationships, workplaces, politics, spiritual communities, Hollywood and the Catholic Church. The evil of the abuse ripples out into the surrounding field, creating more potential trauma and wounding of one sort or another. In just about everyone, influencing people through their unconscious reactions to what the abuse is touching within themselves. These reactions, which occur beneath our level of conscious awareness, create the tapestry by which vertical weaves itself through the warp and woof of our relationships. This dynamic of protecting the abuser is an externalized reflection of a psychological process that exists within each one of us, as we all have a propensity to turn a blind eye toward the darkness within each person, to the extent that we are not fully enlightened. And who is? Is unwittingly protecting the abuser in their own way which means that we are each obstructing a part of ourselves from being illumined. This is where we become complicit in our own abuse. Like an ostrich with its head in the sand, we are keeping ourselves in the dark about what we are unconsciously doing to ourselves. This dynamic also reflects that part of us that through our willful blindness is complicit in the large-scale patterns of oppression that are continually taking place in the world at large, many of them in our name. In turning a blind eye, we are unwittingly supporting and enabling these colossal collective injustices. Though our current world situation may feel so overwhelming that we feel helpless, we can start to access the incredible creative power that lies within us via the process of shedding light on this darkness, which holds our natural creative power captive. Our wounds 
unhealed abuse issues, unassimilated trauma, and unconscious triggers and projections can get in the relational field between us so as to create all sorts of misunderstandings and problems. The vertical bug is at the bottom of most, if not all, of these experiences, bringing about hurts, frustrations and anger, causing us to feel separate from and possibly even threatened by one another. Unless we recognize the deeper, vertical fueled process that is going on and learn to deal with and overcome these vertical inspired feelings. When we've had direct encounters of the vertical kind, which is to say, when we've encountered evil, it can be a bit risky to share our experiences with others. Say, for example, we've had an experience of abuse, which consisted, as it almost always does, of our authentic being and creative self-expression being judged, pathologized, or maybe even shut down by someone in a position of authority, be it a parent, teacher, healer, therapist, or the like. Oftentimes this kind of experience can shake us up so badly that it can completely shatter our sense of the safe world we thought we lived in, which is the very nature of trauma. It can also undermine and debilitate our self-confidence, self-esteem and our sense of self. This encounter can, depending on its intensity, potentially take a long time, years even, or a lifetime, to be fully integrated. Imagine we then go to another authority figure and express to them, as best we can, what our undigested experience of abuse is. Our intent is that if they get what we are trying to share with them, playing the role of an enlightened, compassionate witness, it will help us assimilate and come to terms with the trauma of it all. Because we are still in the process of metabolizing the trauma from our direct, unmediated encounter with the dark side. In all probability, we will have an emotional charge, a passion around what we are trying to transmit. Hearing our trauma-ridden and emotionally charged story, however, can easily constellate an unconscious reaction in the listener. It can then happen that instead of fully receiving, taking in and understanding what we are trying to transmit, which in making us feel understood and see would help us integrate the toxic aspect of the experience. The authority figure diagnoses and pathologizes us instead. Their judgment is an unconscious reaction to what has gotten triggered within them by the traumatic nature of our story, as well as the way we are passionately trying to communicate it. I call this process Traumatized Messenger Dismissal Syndrome, or TMDS. One way to understand this is to see that the unprocessed evil of the abuse that we are trying to share with others, being non-local, does get across 
in the sense of being transmitted to them, but in a way that bypasses their conscious mind, thereby activating their unconscious. Like a magician's conjuration, they get dreamed up by our unconscious as well as their own to play out with us a form of the very evil at which we are pointing. The result? They are then unwittingly recreating and literally acting out with us a more subtle, hard-to-see iteration of the very abuse that brought us to them in the first place. By unintentionally mimicking our original encounter with evil with us, a faint echo of the initial unhealed abuse is making itself known through our interaction. Though different in scale and degree, this reenactment consists of the same archetypal form and pattern of our original encounter with evil. In speaking about our unhealed abuse, we then evoke it in the field such that it can then enact itself in a disguised but embodied form. This process shows us how language, the power of the word, particularly when it is imbued with emotional energy, can be a vector for the transmission of vertical. Likewise, depending on how language is used and its effect processed, it can also liberate us. This kind of experience has the potential to be incredibly re-traumatizing, as now the original trauma is combined with a newer version overlaid on it. But if we have the awareness that the other person's reaction being a function of their own unintegrated trauma has more to do with them than it does with us. Being able to find and create a name for this dynamic has enabled me to more clearly see this unconscious process and this has helped me access the hidden potential healing that has been encoded within the process all along. So, instead of this heretofore unconscious process having its way with me, I find my way by using it to create my own path. In attempting to shut down the light of consciousness and provide cover for the darkness, Vetico is simultaneously revealing itself by showing us how it works and who it works for. The powers of darkness. In its attempt to snuff out the light, however, Vetico is exposing its dark agenda, which thereby feeds the very light it is trying to destroy. This brings up the thought. Is Wetico a double agent? Does it secretly work for the light? Whether the light becomes obscured or shines brighter depends on whether we register in our consciousness what is openly being revealed to us. We all have, to whatever degree, our unconscious wounds, traumas, unhealed abuse issues and shadow content. A good way to understand how vertical plays out in our relationships is to contemplate how dreams, which are unmediated expressions of the unconscious, work. In a night dream, our unhealed unconscious parts get dreamed up. For a dream is nothing other than 
a reflection of our inner process. If we don't recognize that, the unconscious shadow aspect that we're interacting with in the dream are actually in the reflections of parts of us, we will instinctively react and act out what has gotten triggered within us by these unrecognized parts. We will then unconsciously recreate and play out our unhealed wounds in a way that perpetuates them, becoming re-traumatized in the process. In the same way, our unconscious is projected out into the world. We then connect the dots on the waking ink plot so as to create meaning. We dream up and create in fully materialized form our unhealed unconscious parts, which we will then interact with and act out via our relationships. Like an artist, we sculpt, giving shape and embodied form to our unhealed unconscious inner process in the seemingly outer landscape of our relationships. If we don't notice the reflective correlation between the inner landscape of our unconscious life and our experiences in the world, as if falling under a spell, we will feel victimized by what happens to us through our relationships, not realizing the part we are playing in creating our experiences. Vetico, it should be remembered, acts itself out through the projective tendencies of the mind. It is as if our unconscious scans the environment for people who based on their unconscious shadow and wounds, have suitable hooks on which we can hang our projections. Once we find someone who can carry our projections, we continually evoke and subtly amplify the shadow aspects of the other person, unconsciously solidifying them to practically embody this shadow quality at least in our mind, so that they can play out an unconscious shadow part of ourself. Being that this entire process happens unconsciously, it has the same underlying dynamic as how our unconscious crafts our dreams at night. We are dreaming not just at night, but through our waking lives as well, experiencing an instantaneous rendering of the contents of our unconscious through the various forms of our waking experience. This dynamic underlies the diabolical nature of the repetition compulsion, which is the very pathology of trauma. Our unhealed trauma compels us beneath our conscious awareness to recreate and play out the original trauma in hidden and not so hidden forms, again and again, encoded within our compulsively acting out our trauma, however, is its potential resolution. Our unconscious forgotten dissociated dismembered and unremembered parts that inform our trauma are longing to be consciously experienced, which would liberate the unconscious energy that's continually enliving the recreation of the original trauma. The frozen energy that animates the trauma is continually taking on physical form so as to act itself out, which is the very medium through which it can be unlocked in order to rejoin the wholeness of the psyche. It is as if our trauma needs something to push up against in order to be liberated.
There was hope. Perhaps I was not meant to die today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, I said in silence. Mental telepathy. It is the way humans were designed to communicate. Different languages and various written alphabets are eliminated as obstacles when people use head-to-head -head talk. But it would never work in my world, I reasoned, where people steal from the company, cheat on taxes, have affairs. My people would never stand for being literally open-minded. There is too much deception, too much hurt, too much bitterness to hide. Mental telepathy was something I sensed the people back home would find difficult to believe. They could easily accept that humans around the world were cruel to each other, but would be reluctant to believe there were people on Earth who were not racist, who lived together in total support and harmony who discover their own unique talent and honour it as well as honour everyone else. The reason, according to Uta, that real people can use telepathy is because, above all, they never tell a lie, not a small fabrication, not a partial truth, nor any gross unreal statement, no lies at all, so they have nothing to hide. They are a group of people who are not afraid to have their minds open, to receive and are willing to give one another information. The real people don't think the voice was designed for talking. You do that with your heart, head, center. If the voice is used for speech, one tends to get into small, unnecessary and less spiritual conversation. The voice is made for singing, for celebration and healing. They told me everyone has multiple talents and everyone can sing. If I don't honor the gift because I thought I couldn't sing, that wouldn't diminish the singer within me. Later, during our journey, when they worked with me to develop my mental communication, I learned that. As long as I had anything in my heart or my head, I still felt necessary to hide. It would not work. I had to come to peace with everything. I had to learn to forgive myself. Not to judge, but to learn from the past. They showed me how vital it is to accept, be truthful and love myself, so I could do the same with others. Spirit woman stood, hands extended over her head, offering her talent to the invisible audience in the sky. She opened herself to be a means of expression if divine oneness were to operate through her that day. She desired to share her talent with me. The Revisioning Jung's Idea of Synchronicity
Synchronicity is considered to be one of the most important ideas emerging out of the 20th century. Jung coined the term synchronicity to describe a category of experience that defied and had an altogether different logic than the widely accepted and virtually unquestioned logic of linear sequential causality. The idea that a cause precedes an effect in linear time was generally thought to be the only kind of causality operating in the universe during Jung's time. Bringing force, the notion of synchronicity was thus a bold and heretical act by Jung. It was a radical departure and challenged the most inviolable, sacrosanct and seemingly unassailable foundation of the modern scientific materialistic value. In his idea of synchronicity, Jung proposed a completely different kind of organizing principle at play in the universe, one that was quite alien to the widely accepted Western worldview of how the universe worked. Jung was of the opinion that it is our strongly ingrained belief in the sovereign power of causality that makes it seem unthinkable that causelessness events could ever happen. But if events without a cause actually do exist, Jung regarded them as creative acts that are not derivable from any known antecedents. The type of causation we are dealing with in synchronicities was totally unknown to the prevailing Western scientific mindset in Jung's day. In his theory of synchronicity, Jung was articulating a radically new vision of reality, a new worldview that was completely out of the box and off the radar of the existing scientific materialistic paradigm. In his conception of synchronicity as being a causal, it is conceivable that Jung was way ahead of his time and was tapping into and pointing at the underlying unified quantum field, which from our spatial, temporal and dualistic perception is openly hidden in the midst of our physical world. We can now redefine synchronicity as a simul causal connecting principle in which causality happens vertically, simultaneously, in addition to horizontally, over linear time. Vertical causality refers to a kind of causality that occurs between different dimensions or domains of our experience that are inseparably embedded and inter-nested within one another in the same moment. This perfectly describes the interdimensional relationship between the subjective world within us, which takes place in a higher dimension, in is up dimensionally compared to the lower dimensions of the seemingly outer 3D world of matter, time, and our physical sense perceptions, commonly known as the space-time continuum. The higher dimension and the lower dimension of our experience interpenetrate each other so fully such that there's an intrinsic connectivity between them through the simul causal connecting principle, which allows these two realms to instantaneously influence each other interdimensionally 
in literally no time at all. The different dimensions of mind and matter that are conceived as influencing each other interdimensionally are ultimately not two separate dimensions that are interacting with each other, but rather a multidimensional continuum that is inseparably one. To recognize this is to begin to see the dreamlike nature of our universe, where just like our dreams, at night, the physical world we experience is not separate or separable from our consciousness. Synchronicities thus operate through an instantaneous simulcausal resonance or interdimensional coordination between the contents of our inner higher dimensional life, our mind, and the outer events taking place in the lower dimensional 3D physical universe. These two domains, our inner subjective and outer objective life, are conventionally thought to be distinct and non-interacting, but are in fact inseparably interconnected parts of a unified multi-dimensional whole system. Jung considered synchronicity to be the contact point between physics and psychology, where the two meet. It is the corollary in the inner human experience of the seemingly external quantum idea. In synchronicity, there is a peculiar interdependence between external events and the subjective psychological state of the observer. Synchronicities are those moments of meaningful coincidence when the boundary dissolves between the inner and the outer so as to reveal their oneness and as such they are a form of revelation. At the synchronistic moment just like a dream, our internal subjective state appears as if it is materializing in the outside world. Synchronistic experiences reflect back the fact that the human mind does not exist in isolation from the world, nor is it just passively aware of the world, but is somehow mysteriously linked to the world in a way that the mind can potentially become aware of. Our psyche is set up in accord with the structure of the universe. What is happening in the macrocosm of the universe is in some way connected to the deepest subjective reaches of the microcosm that is the individual psyche. In a synchronicity, the conjunction of two cosmic principles, psyche and matter, takes place, and in the process a real exchange of attributes occurs as well. The psyche behaves as if it were material, and matter behaves as if it were an expression of the psyche. In synchronistic phenomena, the opposites of spirit and matter reciprocally inform and reflect each other, uniting in a timeless embrace, in a synchronistic moment in time. The opposites openly reveal their interconnectedness and inseparability. The mental and physical dimensions of life, like the form and content of experience, are revealed as only separable in thought, not in reality. Instead of orienting ourselves one sidedly to the spiritual, to the exclusion of matter, or 
Two material matters disconnected from the spiritual. Jung felt that the central psycho-spiritual task of our unique moment in history is to realize the unity of spirit and matter, which is what synchronistic events are all about. Instead of or in addition to spirit coming down from the heavens above, spirit's guidance is emerging and rising up from within matter and is waiting to be recognized. Going to the heart of our being, synchronicities are moments in time when there is a fissure in the fabric of what we have taken for reality and there is a bleed through from a higher dimension outside of time. Synchronistic phenomena are moments in time when the timeless, dreamlike nature of the universe shines forth its radiance and openly reveals itself to us, offering us an open doorway to lucidity. They are simultaneously pointing at and doorways into the very dreamlike nature of which they are expressions. Just as Casualty describes the link between the sequence of events, synchronicity deals with the coincidence of events, one of which is psychic, what is happening inside our mind, both outer events and inner psychic events are exponents of the same moment in time. Anything happening in the moment, including what is happening in our mind, belongs to and is an inseparable part of unmediated expression of that particular moment of time. Synchronistic occurrences show that whatever is happening in a specific moment in time isn't mere coincidence, but is connected through a sense of meaning that is related to what is going on within one's mind. Synchronistic phenomena, which are quantum in nature, and quantum physics do strange things to the notion of causality. Both invite us, in Philip K. Dick's words, to discard the modem of causation which is a fundamental structuring factor in our perception, which he felt was a major conceptual occlusion to seeing reality. Jung realized that the causality principle, what he calls one of our most sacred dogmas, is insufficient to explain certain manifestations of the unconscious. As an explanatory principle, causality is only one possible category of thought to describe the connection between events. In his idea of synchronicity, Jung proposed a new principle in nature by adding an a causal link. A synchronistic universe balances and complements the mechanistic world of linear causality with a realm that is outside of space, time and causality. In a synchronicity to heterogeneous world systems, the causal and acausal interlock and interpenetrate each other for a moment in time, which is both an expression of and the vehicle through which our deeper wholeness is revealing itself. Synchronicities are glimpses of transcendental unity, what in Latin is called the Unus Mundus, the One World. The Unus Mundus is the unitary and unifying realm 
that underlies and pervades all dimensions of our experience. The Onus Mundus is a psychophysical reality, a universe beyond time and outside of space, in which psyche and matter are inseparably joined as interconnected parts of a deeper unified field. The Unus Mundus is a world in which we have already woken up. It is a realm beyond duality, beyond opposites, beyond even the concept of beyond. In the Unus Mundus, opposites like matter and psyche form the outer world and inner aspects of the same transcendental reality revealing its designs through events in the outer world as well as the psychic landscape within. The Unus Mundus actualizes itself in time as we divine our wholeness through the synchronistic clues encoded within the fabric of experience itself. The Synchronistic Universe is beginningless in that we are participating in its creation right now. From this a temporal meta perspective, there is a single underlying event that appears to be spread throughout time and space. Jung calls synchronicities acts of creation in time. Notably, in quantum physics, the act of observation is considered to be a unique and elementary act of creation in time. The resulting universe arises concomitant with our observation, which is an act of creation in time that unfolds continually from the singular now moment, generating endlessly unique explications of itself that give rise to the appearance of sequential events happening over linear time.